Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second speaker session under Episteem 2021. Episteem is the annual finance festival of Sri Ram College of Commerce organized by the Finance and Investment Cell. This year, we are proud to announce that the first online edition of Episteem has witnessed a participation of over 10,000. Each of our six competitions have had over 1,500 registrations each, and for the first time, we have insightful panel discussions and speaker sessions. We are also pleased to announce that among Episteem's partners this year are leading corporates, Bajaj Capital, Ernest & Young, HDFC Mutual Funds, Business Standard, and Grand Thornton, among many others. We now have our second speaker session organized as part of Episteme 21. Our next speaker is a prominent economist who has spent over five decades in the field of public affairs. Sri Nitin Desai, sir, a former chief economic advisor and the member of the planning commission, sir, has also served in various capacities at the United Nations, retiring as the head of United Nations Development of Economic and Social Affairs. It is so fascinating to all of us that Sir was associated with the famous Brunton Commission and was one of the economists instrumental in introducing the concept of sustainable development to the world. An alumnus of London School of Economics and Political Science, Sir worked as a professor and consultant before joining the Planning Commission in 1973. From 1990 to 2003, he worked for the United Nations after having served as the Secretary of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council and as Chief Economic Advisor. So we are so delighted to welcome you to Episteme and we are so honored to have you among us. We all are really excited to hear from you. I now invite Devashish Miglani, President of FIC, to welcome sir. Uh, good morning, everyone. I welcome you all to uh, Episteme 21, one of the largest finance uh, summits of India with more than 10,000 participants, as Nehal mentioned. We are very excited to have you all here. I, uh, On behalf of FIC Sri Ramgaj of Commerce, I welcome Sri Nitin Desai, sir. I thank him for taking time from his busy schedule. I also uh, would like to say, sir, our teacher in charge, Ms. Saroj Joshi, uh, has been trying to join the session for very long. However, there has been some network issues at her place. She uh, regrets uh, her absence and uh, she's literally trying to join by the end. We uh, welcome you all and we hope that you, uh, that all the participants have a great time learning from sir's wide experience and deep knowledge. Uh, sir, over to you. We are more than happy and uh, grateful to you for to attend this session. Over to you, thank sir. You very, thank you very much, Nihal. Thank you very much, Devashish. And it's a pleasure for me to talk to all of you uh, and uh, today. And uh, I look forward to the one hour session that we have. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is what I call finance for development. And uh, you know, Neha just told you that I used to teach in England. And 50 years ago, when I was teaching in England, the Reserve Bank approached me to see whether I would be willing to return to India to go and work there. And at that time, I prepared a, propos a proposal on what research I would do there. And that research was on finance for development, which is what are the long-term changes that you can expect in a financial system as a country grows, develops, uh, as its structure changes over time. Uh, I did not join the Reserve Bank because various things happened, whereas that thing has never been done. So now 50 years later, I'm going to be talking to you people about that. Only thing is, this is not my insights from 50 years ago. It's what I have learned later as I worked in India. And as I've seen the, how the financial market has evolved over the past few decades as a saver and as an investor. I'm going to be using a uh, PowerPoint because I think the, this is something where uh, it is easier to explain things with a PowerPoint than just simply uh, talking about it. So give me a second while I share the screen. So I think the screen is with you. Yes, sir, we can see the screen. Okay, this is just a title on uh, financial development. And uh, what I propose to be talking, what I'm going to talk about to you is how do finance, what is it that shapes the changing structure of financial markets as we move, uh, as the economy grows, as its structure changes? And basically, changes in financial markets are shaped by two things. How the pattern of household savings changes 
and how the borrowing requirements of investors change. The, the changes in the pattern of household savings that you will see as an economy grows is a shift of, between uh, financial savings and direct investment. Every country, even an agricultural country, farmers and others save and invest directly in improving their farms and so on. But over time, there are more and more people who are not themselves uh, entrepreneurs or businessmen or farmers, and their savings takes the form of finance. So one shift you will see always is a shift from the, what we call direct savings in the form of investment and financial savings. And secondly, people's preferences for financial assets in terms of time profile and volatility will change. I'll come back to this uh, when I talk about what other changes we can expect in India. On the borrowing side, you will, there's a shift from working capital to fixed investment. In agriculture, the big requirement of capital is of working capital. I need to pay my workers and others before the harvest comes in, and I can return that after the harvest comes in. It's a one-year requirement of working capital. But if I'm setting up industries, I need fixed investment where people have to lend me money, not for one year, but for decades. The time horizon of investments changes. That previously where, okay, if I'm investing in a shop, I'm investing in a small plant, my time horizon of investment is maybe a few years. But when I get into infrastructure in investment, then it becomes much longer. And infrastructure lasts for 30, 40, 50 years. And the third thing that happens is that all of these things over time change, new entrepreneurs come to the market. Oh. I'll go into the next. Okay, sorry. I was tapping the wrong arrow. Uh, what are the long-term changes in financial markets that we've seen in India? I thought just I'll give you a sense uh, by taking a long view from 1950-51 to 2010-11 every three years. Now, if you see the numbers here, the first thing you'll notice is how the gross savings have grown fourfold from 9% of GDP to 36% of GDP. How household savings have increased, uh, financial savings of households, from practically negligible amount of uh, to 14% of uh, GDP. Remember 2010-11 was a peak year. Since then the financial savings have come down, but we'll come back to that. And physical savings, what households directly invested in uh, say improving the farm or tidying up their uh, retail establishment has gone up from six to 13%. The, but the big things that you will see a huge increase in the, in the savings of private corporations, which were less than 1% of GDP uh, in 1551. They rose to 1.4, so a small rise. And the big increase comes after the liberalization of 1991. And in 2010-11, the, their savings were 10% of GDP as against 1% before. And then you have the public sector savings, the savings of the government, and its enterprises, which has which went up to 3.5, but since then has come down. Where did the investment come from? Now you can see that in 1950-51, of the 11% of gross fixed investment, 8%, most of it was in the household sector, farms, small enterprises, etc. But when you get to 2010-11, just about a th third of it is in the household sector. The rest is in private corporations and the public sector, whose share in investment shot up from 1% to 12%, from 3% to 8%. This is a structural change which comes when an agricultural economy starts moving towards becoming an industrial and service economy. And I just thought I'd present this to you uh, from the perspective of uh, what, what we can expect in the changes we can expect in the future. And if I go on, what are the changes that I would expect to see? Let me first focus on savings. 
And I'm going to spend a little time on savings. The first shift I would expect is a con continuation of the shift of, from direct accumulation of physical assets to financial savings. Most of the, what we call household savings in the form of physical assets. Uh, remember in India, household includes non-corporate enterprises, shops, small enterprises, and so on. So that, that particular part depends on how large that group is. And uh, that group is you know, more and more of those companies, those enterprises will start getting organized in a much more, and they, and they will therefore, their investment, they become part, so to speak, of the corporate sector. And therefore you will see a shift of household savings from physical assets to more and more financial savings. But the more, most important thing is how. This is the second sentence here. Basically, why do I save as a, as a salary earner? The major reason for my saving is I need to have an income when I retire at 60, 65, or whatever it is that the retirement age is for wage and salary earners. Today, only a limited number of Indians are wage and salary earners. And many of them who are in the organized sector of the uh, economy have a system of retirement savings where let's say seven and a half percent comes from their salary and seven and a half percent will come from uh, the employer. Now this proportion of savings for retirement in the form of life insurance and other forms will go up because the proportion of wage and salary earners will go up as the economy has more and more organized sector manufacturing and service units, which are uh, employing people on, uh, on wages and salaries, rather than self-employed people running small enterprises. And therefore one can expect a big increase in that. The third thing that I would focus on here is the growth in the number of high net worth individuals in India, Indians who are wealthy. The definition for in the financial market of high net worth individuals, it is an international definition, is any individual, any family with assets other than their own house, which they live in, worth more than one uh, million dollars is called a high net worth. They're called high net worth individuals, HNWIs. And that number is increasing. We have about at least 300,000 of them now in India. And these are the people who invest in stock market. If you are a saver, your savings or retirement is where you look for certain security and safety. You become a stock market investor, mainly when you have taken care by and large of your saving for retirement and the other requirements that you have during your 40 year working life. It may be for a house, it may be for your children's education or whatever. These are the changes that I expect to see. More savings for retirement and a growing number of high net worth individuals uh, investing in the stock, the stock market. And now if I go on to the actual numbers of these, this is a simple, a quick thing that I can go through. This is uh, household savings as a percentage of gross national disposable income. It was around 23% in 2011, 12, and it has been a bit of a decline, but it's more or less stable at, uh, 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 since 2015-16, which remains below 20%. But the smaller line, this one, smaller one, is the investment that they have made in financial savings. Now that you see is not actually falling all that much. In fact, it seems to be quite stable at say around 10, 11% of uh, uh, disposable income. What is falling is the direct investment by households in assets, which is household savings, in the form of direct investment in assets. 
uh, you know, of the sort that I had described. That is what is tending to fall uh, over the past few, uh, past decade. And now if I focus on the gross financial savings of households in recent years, I've put data for the past three years here, uh, you'll see that of the total of 10 to 12%, roughly little under half goes into currency and deposits, which is time deposits in banks and so on. What less than 1% goes into shares and debentures. And about three to four, around 4%, 4 you can say, is basically what I have called retirement savings, which is the money, the insurance premium that people are paid, the money they're put into provident funds and into pension funds. And this is uh, one of the most crucial determinants of uh, savings that you will see over time. Because more and more people move from being self-employed to being wage and salary earners. Uh, if I see the, however, the trend of life insurance premium, which is only one component, provident fund and uh, pension funds are different. Uh, it has not really been growing as a percentage of uh, GDP. The percentage of GDP which goes in India towards uh, insurance, uh, life insurance premium is basically still around two to three percent. There was a brief period in the when we had the big boom uh, in 2004 to 2008, when it went up to four percent, but it's now back at around three percent or so. And it's very low, relatively low compared to international standards. Now, if I look at uh, you know, what it should be, well, before I come to that, uh, I just want to quickly mention some besides life insurance, uh, India has also started a national pension system. Uh, this was initially started for government servants. Uh, I, became, I was, a, I was a guard, retired as a government servant in 2001, and I enjoy a pension because my pension is, to, is, is a right which I had because I had worked for the government. But that changed after 2004. After 2004, there was no defined pension for its employees. They had to join the national pension scheme with contributions by them and by the government. Uh, it was opened up for all citizens of India in 2009, and there are various tax advantages that you could get because of that. The uh, contributions are tax exempt, 40% of the corpus escapes tax. And as of uh, the most recent data, uh, end December 2020, there are about 14 million subscribers, mostly government servants, and the assets under management are about 5.3 trillion rupees, or if you prefer. 5.3 lakh crores, uh, but most of it is still accounted for by government employees. I just thought I'd quickly mention that there is a formal pension scheme, because this is something that will uh, be more very relevant for all of you when you start working. Uh, I now want to make a little calculation. What should savings for retirement be? Let's, I've taken two, two, two premises, 10% and 15%. And I assume that my income grows at 6% per year, the growth rate of the economy over the 40 years that I work. And that I, my earnings on what I save, remember what I save in the first year of my working life will accumulate interest over 40 years. And what of course what I save in the last year will not. What is this rate at which it will accumulate interest? The first number is it will earn interest at 3% per year. Why 3%? Because 3% is what the real rate of return works out to. If I take the rate on term deposits of five years or more and deduct inflation from that, then the average over the past 40 years is a 3% real rate of return. And I've focused on this because in a sense, you're interested in real rate of return. Because 40 years later, prices will be way up to what they were when you started. So what you're always going to look at is what is going to be the real value of my assets at the end. The third column, this one, tells you what is the total savings of at the end of the 40 years 
as a multiple of your base level annual income. 25 times, if you are saving 10% of your income and earning 3%, and 37 times, if you are saving 15% and earning 3%. Now, the second calculation I made is suppose the earnings on your savings really are not 3% but 6%, then the same numbers you, are, you will have at the end of the retirement will have 42 times your base level income as your assets or 63 and the income that you will earn from this in relation to your income at retirement, not base level, will be 20, roughly 25% or 36%. And in a sense, this tells you why people save around 10 to 15% of their income for retirement, because that is what will give them this sort of range of income as a proportion of their retirement income, uh, their, what the income was when they retired, which will be much higher than what they, when they started. And this is what, if you look at this, and I apply it, the share of wage and salary incomes in national gross national disposable income is about 30%. It's the average for this decade. About 30% of gross national disposable income consists of the income of wage and salary earners, mainly in the organized sector. If 15% of wage and salary earners contributed for retirement benefits, then the savings for this will be 4.5% of GNDI, which is more or less comparable to the numbers that I've shown you earlier, which range between three and a half and 4%, because there are people who will probably not be as rigorous in their saving for retirement as my calculation suggests. Now this, sorry, this number is what will go up, 4.5%. As, as the proportion of gross national disposable income which accrues as wages and salaries goes up from 30%, up, this number will go up. And my expectation is that this will probably reach within a decade or so about five, about five and a half, six percent of uh, national disposable income, which is almost the same as GDP. Let me now turn to the, so that is one experiment. Let me now turn to the second part of savings, the savings in uh, the stock market. This is more unpredictable. Uh, as I said, the number of mostly it comes from high net worth individuals. If I look at stock market, uh, mutual fund data in India, about 40% of mutual funds are owned by corporations. 40% of the assets of mutual funds are owned by corporations. 33% are owned by what I call high net worth individuals. They are the major investors. In, not just in mutual funds, but much more so in the stock market. And they account for just said one third of mutual fund holdings. The number who are super rich, worth more than 30 million, is expected to double in five years in India. What are, where do they come from? Where do these high net worth individuals come from? One are people who own their own businesses. Now those people are going to invest in their own business they probably won't be major players in the stock market. The people who are coming in, who are looking to the stock market as a major source, major avenue for investment, are people who have made gains from stock ownership, from real estate. And nowadays, you have a lot of people at the top level in corporate management who are earning very high salaries, salaries of even one and two crores, and this is what they are the people who are high net worth individuals. And then you have the startups, particularly infotech startups, where you have very rapid capital appreciation because somebody comes and buys you up. These are the people who are high net worth individuals. Now, one of the points I would make here is this only about 25% of private wealth, the high of these high net worth individuals, is professionally managed. Most of them are trying to do the management themselves. And I mentioned this because I see this as a potential area of work for youngsters like you in providing advisory services to growing numbers of high net worth individuals. Their numbers uh, have been growing, but not as rapidly as we thought. 
in 2000, it's from, from 219, it has gone up to 263. That's about a little over 40,000 uh, in the from between two over the past six years. Now, that's not that's not huge, but the expectation is that it will grow up. And one of the reasons why this expectation is there is the issue of uh, you know the new startup the, the startup economy that is emerging in India. So let me now turn to the, these are the stock market trends. Uh, as you can see, the savings in shares and debentures as a percentage of GDP did go up post, particularly uh, during the uh, immediate, uh, uh, immediately after the liberalization of 1991. But then there was this terrible scams and all sorts of things happened, then it fell. And since then, frankly, it has not really picked up. Uh, it tends to fluctuate a lot. Market capitalization, what is the value of the shares relative to GDP? It was around 40%, it is now around 80% of GDP, a little old under 75% of GDP. And a big change came in this boom period from 2004 to 2008. This was a big boom period when this changed. And, but since then, it's been more or less static. Let's now turn to the other side, the borrowing side. We've talked about where will the new type, new savings come from. They come from people saving for retirement. They come from high net worth individuals who are ready to invest their uh, funds in stock markets. Uh, and that's where it will uh, come from. What are the changing patterns of investment? The first major shift that's taking place, it's already underway, may become more accelerated now is the growing role of the private sector in infrastructure because of the rising, two reasons. One is the rising proportion of renewable energy sources in power supply. <laughs> and most of the investment in renewable energy sources comes from the private sector. The second is the monetization of public sector assets, which the government has announced. We'll come back to this. It's a very interesting area, this monetization of public sector assets. It's not just privatizing public sector companies, but also other things like trying to monetize completed infrastructure projects, like a toll road. As far as corporate sectors are concerned, I don't see huge changes. And the present mix of retained earnings, stock market issues, private equity, and foreign investment will continue. I don't see major shifts because this has now become a well-developed area of work, the financing of investments for the private sector. The third area is of micro, medium and small enterprises, which at the moment depend almost entirely on informal financing. I will expect over the next decade and two decades that there'll be much more formal financing for micro, medium and small enterprises. And finally, more, in, more domestic financing for innovative startups. Let me move on. Now, infrastructure investment as a proportion of GDP has been around 8% or thereabouts, but I've included electricity, construction, transport, communication, storage, which is as reported in the national accounts. It's not, it, it, it fell a bit, and since then it has recovered, but frankly, it's nothing much. It's more or less static at around 7% of GDP, you can say that. The share of the public sector in this in investment in this decade has remained around, I would say 40%, though there was a little peak in 2014 and 2016 when because private sector investment in infrastructure uh, fell quite a bit in this two, these two years, but it's around 40%. But what we need to do is to break this up a little. And I break it up into two parts. First is electricity and other utilities. And you will see that the public sector has a more than two thirds share in the investment in electricity, water supply and things of this sort. And the private sector is about a one third share. But if I take the other areas of infrastructure, transport, communication and storage, 
then the picture looks a little different. And you will see that the share of the public sector, uh, the share of the private sector, is uh, the share of the public sector is relatively small, 15%. The share of the private sector is nearly 55%. And the share of the household sector is th nearly 30%. Uh, private sectors, private corporations, and, and the non-corporate private sector is 30%. So it's only 15% of investment outside the utilities area. Infrastructure investment is uh, in the public sector. It's mainly in, in electricity, as I said, this is going to change because of the growing importance of renewable energy financing. Already renewable energy investment in India exceeds the investments in power supply from coal, uh, et cetera. And uh, you're going to see a major change and major shift in this. So one of the big shifts I would expect is in, the, in this number, which was here, where I think the share of the public sector will come down very substantially and the share of the private sector will go up uh, because you're already quite high outside the electricity and utility sector. And it'll go up in the electricity and utility sector very substantially. Now, solar, wind, and other are largely in the private sector, and there is capacity is expected to go up <coughs> very substantially. Let me turn to this monetization program, the asset monetization program. Now, this includes about two or three different things. One is the sale of shares in public enterprises including privatization for some. Second is the sale of assets owned by the government, which they're not using, like unused land. The government railways, uh, the, uh, the defense forces, and others own vast areas of land, which they're not using. But even more interesting is the sale of completed revenue earning projects like toll roads. So for instance, the government has built a toll road. It is ready, it's being used, Toll is being collected. Now what they're proposing is, we'll now sell this and generate, uh, and it'll be purchased by somebody on the basis of the expected future earnings, which are quite predictable, but it's a completed project, the toll earnings are known. And this is something which is quite attractive for private savers who are looking for investments with a very, well-defined return, like the like a toll road. And this is what the government is planning to do. So this is going to generate a very substantial demand from the private sector for infrastructure investment. The caution that I'm ended at the end is that the resulting demand for funds will have to be met in a manner that avoids the risk of NPAs, non-performing assets of banks which actually arose, has arisen largely because of the public-private uh, partnership infrastructure program launched in the 90s. That was a program which was launched without really doing the, the reforms and tariffs and other things which were necessary in order to make these infrastructure investments viable individually and separately. And that is what has led to this uh, NPAs in uh, uh, in banks. So these are the uh, areas that I, uh, a private corporate savings as a percentage of uh, savings investment as a percentage of, has been going up. As you can see, gross savings is a pink part. It went up very substantially to, uh, uh, and then has declined a little. Corporate investment was also quite high. It has declined. But this is not an area where I expect uh, major changes in the way in which the things are, are, are happening. Let me run, uh, we have running a little short time, so let me rush a little and move to the area where I think changes will take place. This is on the medium, small, and micro, and micro, small, and medium enterprises. This is the share in national income. They're pretty important. As you can see, they account for over 13% of national income. Uh, the total number is about 55 million, registered 
unregistered informal 47.6 so most of them are not even properly registered about 11 million of these 55 million are in the manufacturing sector and the remaining are in the service sector mainly in the retail uh, uh, trade uh, they have ownership structure proprietorship or partnership mostly hardly any are organized as companies the in activities electricity you can even though it's minor it is a tra trade is the big item uh, manufacturing and other services manufacturing as is accounts for 31% of their activity trade 36 and this 33 this is what small enterprises do employment is very similar uh, between these three areas is not very different. They have more or less the same pattern. As you can see, if you compare the two sets of numbers, this, the previous one, which I showed, you see there's not much difference in the percentages. Where does the money come from? The total supply of debt to borrow in most debt, 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 equity, that in the part which is not debt is basically their own money, their family money, money taken from friends, etc. Uh, they are not, uh, they're organizers, proprietorships, so there are no shares or anything to be looked at there. So leave that equity to one side. But they do need work, debt, debt for working capital, debt for investment. The, for, out of the 69, 70 trillion, 70 lakh crores, if you like, uh, the formal sources is just 10.9 trillion rupees, 11, say. 11 lakh crores comes from formal sources. 58 lakh crores come from informal sources. And the formal sources are listed here in what is quite small. The big change that I expect to see is a shift more and more because the scale of requirements is such that there's a limit to how, you, how much you can depend on informal sources uh, for this purposes. So, this is the change that I would really expect to see uh, uh, in more formal structures for the financing of MEs. Uh, what form this will take is an open question. Whether it will take the form of uh, new types of banks, which are emerging now for small industries, whether it will take the form of uh, equity funds which specialize in MSCs, that is something which is still an open question. And that really brings me to my last area, and that is startups. This is the big growth area in India. The startups that are based on people doing some new business model, a new technology, a new product, a new process, not necessarily developed by them. Sometimes something which they import from abroad, from a startup which has actually started somewhere else. And you can see that the scale of funding or startup investment deals has really gone up very substantially to about nearly 8 billion US dollars a year in, in 2019. 2020 will be lower because of uh, the, the COVID. Uh, If you see a startup ecosystem, if you see what is it like for, uh, the, the, for a, how does a startup progress from an idea in the mind of, let's say, a IIT graduate or something to something which actually in the end ends up in a perfect market. This is the, the time profile. In the first stage, when it's just an idea, you need a seed fund. Where would the seed fund come from in this? seed stage when the idea is being worked out. Uh, it can come from some government source, it can come from an incubator which has been set up by an IIT, it can come from angel investors who are ready to take risks. This is an important area. Once the idea is established, once the idea is established, then you get to this early stage when they need in the smaller venture funds, the venture funds which start uh, investing in the companies well before they are fully proven and established, uh, 
that comes in, this is the, uh, what we call the early stage. Now, once the thing has been established, once you've got clients, once you started earning something, you should probably be running at a loss. Then the larger venture funds, private equity funds come in. You can get mergers and acquisitions. People who are in the same line of business say, my God, that guy is comp going to compete with us. Let us buy him up. Uh, or you make strategic alliances with people who are similar to you. And this is where this sort of funding comes in. And finally, the IPO stage. India is a very large ecosystem for startups. This whole unicorns are uh, startups which acquired a value, uh, a capital value of $1 billion or more. We have 32 of them. And they're expected to triple in the next five years or so. And the total valuation of these 32 is $100 billion. In the 2014 to 19, the five years, these startups raised $50 billion of funding. The current median age of the people who are doing the startups, the guys who do the startups is only 31 years. And on average, each startup created 12 jobs, totaling to 350,000. This is a flourishing area now in India. And we have a, you know, the sectoral pattern of startups, if you can see, where, where did they come from? Uh, the big one uh, is in IT, sir, is in, uh, if you look at this, well, education is small, these are the others, but IT is a big one. Healthcare is next. Augmented and virtual reality type things at third, food and beverage and so on. These are the different types of things that are coming up with startups. To put it a little more simply, e-commerce is a big one. FinTech like Paytm and so on the others. Health tech is big. And logistics, which is for delivery of the things, is another. Now, in many ways, what we need in India is a system of angel investors, venture capital, and private equity, which will provide funding for this. Most of this is coming from people from abroad. One of the great challenges over the next decade and two decades in India, is how do I persuade the high net worth individuals in India? Don't just play the stock market. Start putting your money into promoting these startups, not just because it's a, it's, a, it's a social duty, but you could make a fortune out of it because the valuation, if you invest very frequently, if you invest a, 100 rupees, 1 lakh in a startup, then you, if that startup succeeds, that 1 lakh would run into crores of rupees. So we have to persuade high net worth individuals to be more risk takers than they are. Investing in the stock market is no risk taking, but investing in startups is risk taking, but the returns can also be high. So this is the the fourth area of change that I expect to see. Let me now uh, stop sharing and just conclude and take a few questions. We have a little time. Uh, what I would say is this, and if for youngsters like you, if I look ahead, then one area of change that I expect to see where there are opportunities for young people will be in the area of helping people with their managing their savings, whether it is retirement savings or whether it is high net worth individuals who are trying to manage the money they've accumulated from real estate or from selling their ownership of a company or something like that. The second area where I think there are opportunities is in this area of private sector infrastructure financing. Now, infrastructure financing are big projects. They will be done by big people. But there are a whole lot of things which will need to be done in order to support this, particularly when it comes to monetization of existing assets. For instance, when the government wants to sell a toll road which is already built, how are they going to do it? There will be advisors and others in the middle who will have to show and explain how. There are intermediaries who will help to connect these parts. In the MSME and the startup sector, there are even greater opportunities. 
for new types of institutions, new types of people, new types of advisory services, which I think are opportunities for people like you. So let me now stop at this point. I've spoken a little longer than I expected to, and we have about 10, 15 minutes, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for the discourse. With this, we move on to the next segment, which is the Q&A. So may I proceed? Please. Yes, sir. So we have collected the questions through the participants, through the groups. So starting with the first question, a major increase in savings was noticed in the last two decades, primarily because of the LPG reforms. Does this figure have the potential of reaching more than 50%? No, 50% is a little high. Uh, it happened in a country like China because China, there was a great deal of that 50% was forced investment. Uh, we have to be realistic in an Indian context actually investment now is below 30%. And I think it would be fortunate and good for us if we went back to 36 to 40%. That is probably about the limit that I would expect. I don't expect a huge increase now in savings of the sort that we got between 1950, 51, 80, 81, and 2010, 11. What I expect is a change in the composition of that savings from uh, direct investment by households to financial savings. And that's where the opportunities will come up. But I don't expect to see 50% in India. Thank I would you, say 40% would be very good if it comes. Thank you, sir. Moving on to the next question. Apart from savings for retirement, do you think the reason for higher financial savings is due to greater financial literacy or the creation of more revenues for such savings? I would say that uh, I don't think financial literacy by itself uh, will be enough for savings. What it can do is it can do lead to better direction of savings. In the end, you have to follow a life cycle model to understand savings. You start working, you need money initially to buy your own house, you need money later to get your children educated. You may need money for other reasons. These days, people spend a fortune on getting their kids married. Uh, so these are all things which will uh, lead to your savings. And, but retirement is the most important because after retirement, if there is a wage and salary earner, your only income is what will be the income from your the assets that you have built up. So the financial literacy will improve the way in which people deploy their savings. Uh, they will make sure that, okay, I'm saving for my uh, daughter's marriage she's not going to get a man for five years. So let me see that I put it in such a form that over these five years, I earn a good return. You know? So that financial literacy will help towards that. So I think people will be more conscious of the returns, but I think they will also be conscious of the risk because they are saving for a purpose. They can't afford to take a risk and find that they don't have the money left to get their daughter married. You know? So this is why uh, it's a combination of get the return and risk. And this is where I think advisory services can play a major role. And independent advisory services from people who are not themselves offering things uh, like banks or other or mutual funds is missing in India. The advisors are all from a mutual fund or a bank or something. You know? And you don't know how, how uh, you know, objective their advice is. So I think there is scope here. And particularly now with the national pension scheme, the more and more people go into that, there will be scope because you can in the national pension scheme choose between an equity oriented investment, corporate bond oriented investment, government bond oriented investment. So this is what I would say that the, yes, financial literacy is there, but they will, because of financial literacy, they will be, look for advice. Thank you, sir. Moving on to the next question. The third question is, Many claim that India is a chronic sufferer of the middle income trap because of its sheer size. What bearing does this have on Indian household savings and the economy in general? I, India, India is still nowhere near the middle income trap. We are still a country well below middle income. The majority of our people are, are nowhere near the middle class. Our middle class is barely 20, 30% of the country. 70% of our country consists of working people 
who are working, who are literally living from day to day. We are nowhere near the middle income trap. Our constraint is not the middle income trap. Our constraint is a failure to invest enough in our education to, re to create the skills required for the modern world. That has been our failure. The big difference between us and China, in my view, is the huge difference in human capital. You look at the extent of education, and skills which have been built up in that population, the health status that has been built up in that population, and compare it with the health status and the education status capacities built up in India. And that difference is even greater than the difference in the GDP. It's not one is to four, it is probably closer to one is to 10. So my point is that we are nowhere near the middle income trap right now. We are still, too, still well below it. We will come to that. We'll come to the middle income trap. The answer to the middle income trap lies in entrepreneurial education, in people who are ready to look. Now, this fortunately, I saw this in the uh, in 91, how Indian industry adjusted to liberalization. They had grown up in a regime where there were high import tariffs protecting them. Some, those import tariffs started coming down drastically after 1991. Indian industry went through an adjustment period for about almost a decade, but they did adjust, they did survive, and they did well. So I'd say that the answer to the middle income trap uh, will li lies really in the quality of your entrepreneurship and whether it goes, moves beyond and starts looking beyond. Middle, what, what's a middle income trap? Middle income trap is a country which has done well because it has borrowed technology from ABC and so on and is doing things. And getting out of the middle income trap means I need to have entrepreneurs who realize this is not good enough. That I now have to become a technology developer myself. You know? uh, I think India has the potential for this because we have, that's one thing we have is a scientific and technological capacity for high level industrial research, which we can tap and exploit, which we are not doing it. Right now it's mostly an employment program for scientists, not really generating uh, technologies, but the people are there. And I think the potential is there. You look at, for instance, AstraZeneca and, uh, and the Serum Institute of India. I mean, it's remarkable that, uh, in this context, one of the leading lights in the world on the vaccine production is an Indian company, a privately owned Indian company. Thank you, sir. So moving on. So the next question is, as GNDI goes up, you said that national savings will go up by 6%. Can we expect the same thing with the investments from people or are we more oriented as a saving based economy? Uh, so can you just repeat the question? Can we more oriented? Yes, can sure. we more as, investment in people? As GNDI goes up, you said the national savings will go up by 6%. Can we expect the same thing with the investments from people or are we more oriented as a saving based economy? No, I think uh, in many ways, uh, you're, you're, it's fair enough raising that question. That the growth of the economy is not just going to depend on the savings. The growth of the economy also is going to depend on the quality of its human resources. And this is an area where I would accept that we need to do far more work than we have done. And the problem is it is so challenging because we have to start at the bottom. All the way, you can't improve your university education till you improve your high school education. You can't improve your high school education till you improve your uh, middle and junior school education. Now, the new education policy has come out. Let's see what, what it transpires. But I think uh, it's possible. I see examples in Delhi, where I live, where government schools have become excellent. They have showing better results than private schools. Why? Because there was a government in power which decided this is something we are going to do. And they have really done a lot of work on uh, improving government schools in Delhi and the government schools are not showing better results than elsewhere. But yes, I think we need to go even beyond this into a continuous learning mode. 
that make much more use of things like Zoom uh, to reach out to people and so on. But I would accept I, that I, my focus was on financial development, but our finance is not the only basis for development. Absolutely correct. Finance is only one part. Thank you so much, sir. Like, now this will be the last question. I would like now like to hand it over to Tarini Goel. She is the vice president of the Financial Investment Cell. On behalf of the Finance and Investment Cell of SRCC, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to Sri Nitin Desai, who took our time from his schedule to share his wonderful insights with us. I would also like to thank Ms. Saroj Joshi, our uh, teacher in charge, for all her support, professors of SRCC, and all in attendance for today's session. Thank you for making this uh, session very successful. And thank you, sir, for uh, coming here and sharing your insights with us. It was indeed very interesting. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to have talked to you. And I learned a lot preparing for this lecture. So thank you very much. And I hope that all of you do well and become flourishing individuals as you grow up and start working. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.